Hey, thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, I'm Ken Savage. Uh, this is Darren Sorrentino, and we're solution architects at, Ra at Red Hat. <laughs> Previous <Nice> job. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us uh, at the Boston Kubernetes Summit, <laughs> and uh, we're glad you're here. <laughs> Well, if I can advance here, hold on. So Kubernetes, uh, when we're not making up words, we're busy kind of reenacting bad 70s television shows. Uh, but what does this word mean, right? We're going to get into that. First thing we wanted to do, though, is you've heard that adage, know your audience. And we were hoping that we could get some insight into where you are all at with regard to bare metal, Kubernetes, and everything else. So you can. If you don't mind, this is a live poll. Uh, you can use that URL or you can text as well. Ironic. Bare metal as in ironic. Sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Look at that. <laughs> I knew there'd be a maybe eventually. Uh-oh. Yes is, is fighting. <laughs> yes. Cool. Very cool. Actually, looks like an equal distribution. Yeah. A lot of yeses. Wow. Very cool. All right. That was more than I thought there would be. All right. Let's check out the... The second question that we have, we only have three of these, by the way, so don't be alarmed. Second question is this, are you running Kubernetes on OpenStack? This is a little bit more tough. Yeah. That's kind of what we figured. That's about what I figured, yeah. A lot of maybes. So you don't know if you're running it on OpenStack? <laughs> That's what you're saying? <laughs> I know it starts with a K, but I don't know if I'm running it. OK, so one more que quick question. Have you heard of Kubernetes before this session? Oh, here we thought it was a new word. <laughs> the good thing about making up words is if you Google them, your presentation comes up first. <laughs> Pro tip. All right, cool. Very cool. <laughs> so agenda is really just to justify the approach that we're looking at here, um, talk a little bit about the environment, how we wired it all together, some of the pitfalls of uh, bare metal and Kubernetes together. Some small performance benchmarks, uh, some of the lessons we learned, and then questions. Uh, if you guys have any questions uh, <coughs> midstream, please feel free to raise your hand. Be happy to try to answer. Disclaimer is simply that uh, you know this is an advanced uh, session, so there's a lot of eye charts here. Uh, don't be thrown by that. We kind of put those in there so that you guys could reference them later if you ever wanted to, if you're crazy enough to try to do this. So the plan was for us to use Red Hat OpenStack Platform 10, our favorite, uh, and to deploy a Kubernetes master as a VM and use heat to create Kubernetes nodes, or otherwise known as minions, uh, using Ironic, uh, until we got punched in the face by Mike Tyson. Uh, so that was our original plan. And why would you do this? You know, it's still faster to do this than deploying via sneaker net, of course. Somebody's always got to run out there and cable stuff up, right? Uh, and bare metal. We're, we're metal freaks, so just, metal we have to <laughs> marry the rich OpenStack APIs with Kubernetes and Docker, you know? And there's a lot to do there, right? Hooking up Keystone. Um, 
Well, actually not. I mean, just you get a lot of infrastructure APIs with, with OpenStack, right? Uh, integration with existing enterprise services such as identity, you know, hooking up Keystone to AD and then Kubernetes into Keystone, right? You can do a lot of really cool stuff that way. And of course, we have customers that want to know if and how they can kind of do this, if it's a, if it's a viable solution. So I'll pass it over to Darren here. He's going to talk about the environment. So our lab consisted of uh, six like servers, um, all identically configured with uh, two A processor cores, um, 256 gigs of uh, memory. We weren't trying to run any kind of production workloads on this environment, obviously. Um, it's just a proof of concept um, just to see if we can actually uh, get this thing to work. So we, what we had is uh, we had a single KVM server. Um, we leveraged bind nine on that. Uh, one of the key points we wanted to make uh, in doing this proof of concept is we all realize that everyone has uh, uh, their own DNS servers unless you're like the flat earth society running around with Etsy hosts everywhere. Um, so we wanted to integrate it into a backend bind nine server. Um, so this way it actually uh, replicated something that you might actually do at your environment. We had uh, two open set controllers. The open set controllers were running uh, designate and ironic. Um, and then uh, we had a single compute that we can uh, launch our master VM on, and then two additional bare metal nodes that were uh, provisioned by Ironic uh, for the worker minions of uh, Kubernetes. Um, we used leverage designate um, to, in order to provide the uh, DNS entries for the uh, master as well as the worker nodes. This way they can uh, find each other when they first come up, and uh, obviously Ironic to deploy uh, the worker nodes. So quick rundown of the versions we used. Um, we, we used uh, Red Hat OpenStack 10, shocker. Um, and then uh, it's on RHEL 7.3. Uh, we did pull uh, the Kubernetes though code right from Kubernetes IO, um, just because uh, a lot of developers are pulling that uh, directly from the source. Um, the Docker image we used was the RHEL repository Docker. Um, we baked it into the image, but I'll, I'll get a little bit into that a bit later. So Designate, uh, as you heard earlier t uh, today with all of the OpenStack projects, uh, all the OpenStack projects can stand on their own. Uh, likewise, Designate can stand on its own as it, uh, DNS as a service. Um, so in here, uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, a little bit of an eye chart as far as the uh, configuration that we used in order to uh, configure it for a bind nine backend. Uh, at the bottom, there's a reference link to the uh, OpenStack.org documentation on Designate. Um, so you can actually look at our configuration, take a look at uh, the recommended uh, installation procedures, and uh, make a little bit of sense of this after the, after the presentation. Um, these slides will be available uh, on the summit site uh, at the end of the uh, summit. So having designate up as a service is uh, not enough. You actually have to integrate it with OpenStack. So this way, when you <coughs> launch an instance, it'll actually uh, populate the DNS entry with the IP address. In order to do that, there's two integration points. There's one with Neutron. Uh, these are the settings in Neutron.conf that we had to uh, change in order to um, get this to uh, actually integrate with Designate. And in addition to that, we also had to make some changes to uh, the OVS ML2 plugin um, to add the DNS as the extension driver for uh, OVS. So as a high level overview, uh, you launch an instance within OpenStack uh, Neutron would actually create the port for that instance. It would populate uh, a property within that port that would have the uh, IP address and the fully qualified uh, host name. Um, designate, and then it would uh, call out to designate, which would then generate a DNS record for that and then update the bind nine server in the back end. So the ironic deployment that we uh, deployed, uh, we deployed that as part of uh, our initial deployment using a triple O process. Uh, triple O makes it really easy to install ironic uh, in your uh, cloud. Uh, just a matter of configuring uh, two YAML files um, and uh, doing your deployment. Um, the one thing that you'll notice on the bottom there is a cleaning network UUID. That UUID actually doesn't get populated to post deployment. Um, the purpose of populating that is that when you do a future upgrade uh, using Triple O, because Triple O does support in place upgrades, uh, it doesn't uh, overwrite the cleaning UUID in your Neutron Conf uh, later on. Um, so, this is the ironic YAML basically uh, calling in the uh, puppet uh, scripts in order to actually uh, instantiate ironic on the controllers. 
Uh, again, uh, reference uh, information down bottom uh, for uh, the integration. So there's many ways to skin a cat. So we decided what we would do uh, in order to get this deployment to work is we made a purpose-built image for Kubernetes. The image actually can be launched on either virtual or bare metal, same image for both. Um, within the image, we baked in Docker and uh, NTP. Uh, NTP is uh, very important to have in your Kubernetes cluster to ensure that they're all using the same, clock, uh, same time sync. Um, so basically what happens is uh, when it boots, uh, there's a systemd uh, integration script that we wrote. Um, it pulls down the, Kubernetes, the, the bits from Kubernetes I.O. It looks at the host name. If the host name actually has kube-master in it, um, so you can call it whatever you want, uh, but as long as the kube-master in it, it knows that it's the master node. Everybody else that you launch thinks he's a, a worker node. Um, so what happens is he'll come up, he'll register with DNS if he's the master node. If he's a worker node, he'll start querying DNS for the kube-master node. Um, and then what he'll do is once the kube master node comes up in DNS and he finds it, now he starts making a TCP connection out to uh, Kubernetes on the master node and waiting for the service processes to come up. Once the service processes come up, he uses a static token ID to uh, tie himself into that Kubernetes master uh, server. Um, user data, uh, so we ran into uh, an issue with uh, bare metal um, for whatever reason. Passing a script through user data would run sometimes and not other times. Um, we wanted to dig into that a little bit to debug it, but uh, in, uh, in due to the time uh, restrictions, we didn't really have a chance to dig into what that issue was. So what our workaround was is that we baked the script into system D and actually mounted the config data from the config drive and then pulled the user data information out as uh, variables for the process. So again, uh, real eye chart here. Um, it'll be look much better uh, back at your home, sitting back, relaxing, watching, uh, looking at it on screen at home. Uh, so we, we're going to publish this out. What we're also going to do is we're also, when we publish that, we're going to update it with a GitHub uh, link that actually will, you'll be able to pull the YAML files down right from GitHub. So, but this is the uh, heat template uh, we leveraged to actually deploy um, the master node and the, the minion nodes. So the, the key on this here is it's all driven uh, off of the, uh, the, f um, the, fl the minion, the flavors, and uh, as far as uh, where it's going to be uh, deployed. So I'm going to turn it back over to Ken to talk a little bit about uh, our performance metrics that we saw in doing the deployment. Yeah, so, uh, you know, what happens here is um, you can kind of see by these benchmarks that bare metal is really slow. Uh, <laughs> and this is the punch in our face by Mike Tyson, really. And, you know, we had planned to kind of demo this, but we found that, you know, with the gear that we were using, which is pretty good gear, uh, you're talking about 15 minutes to pull a node up, right? So uh, our thinking was, how would you do this in a, in a production environment? Uh, maybe you'd set a threshold uh, below where you'd want to start uh, you know, uh, getting more infrastructure happening, right? And then allow for that time to spin itself out and then you'll have what you need when you need it, hopefully. Um, the, the downside of that is, you know, other things can happen that could skew that. And you can see uh, Kubernetes up is definitely taking a lot longer with bare metal. Uh, cluster ready is definitely taking a lot longer. Now, we've also uh, looked into some some tweaks with Ironic to, to uh, you know, what it does is it kind of pixie boots uh, and then reboots the server, and that's a lot of what takes so long. Um, and we, we know there's a way to pixie boot and, and kind of to root into that kernel and do it without rebooting. We didn't get a chance to try that, though. Some of the bare metal pitfalls, right? Slow to provision. <laughs> uh, most, most of them take several minutes, in our case, 15 minutes, just to pull one server up, right? So, you, so it'd be difficult to, to do this in an auto-scale environment. Uh, and as Darren mentioned, unreliable user data execution, clouding it um, on the bare metal nodes really wasn't um, doing uh, the user data stuff for us at all. 
Uh, and then finally, no easy auto scaling due to the uh, lack of agents on the bare metal end of things. So if you think about it, when you create a VM, uh, you have a hypervisor, uh, salometer runs, gives you telemetry, you can set alarms and do all kinds of cool stuff uh, based on that with heat and auto scale, right? When you're doing the bare metal, there's nothing there. <laughs> uh, the other option you have is SNMP. Uh, SNMP. Um, that's an option. You can do that. SNMP in our experience, uh, for instance, the default refresh is like 10 minutes. You may not know that you need it until way after you need it. You got to do a lot of tweaking to get SNMP to the point where you're going to auto scale with bare metal nodes, right? Some of the Kubernetes pitfalls. Um, you know, you've got to always maintain a unified time source. And we, we always do that with Red Hat OpenStack anyway. When you, we, if you don't do that with OpenStack, things go wonky, especially on the controller end of things. And the same is true of Kubernetes. Uh, networking gotchas, and um, I have to thank Darren for that mouse trap with the Kubernetes logo on it. I love that. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you're maintaining all the complexity of OpenStack uh, isolation, network isolation, along with all the Kubernetes stuff. You got two things going there, you know. Uh, when things go wrong, you don't necessarily know which of those uh, is at fault. And that's, that's tough to deal with. We, we experienced that big time. And then finally, node names can't be greater than 63 characters. And what Heat likes to do is create these huge um, host names, and we ran into that. One of the first ones we did was 65, I think. Kubernetes has a limit of 63. Yeah. So um, we, we did find a workaround for that. Um, it, you want to yeah. tell them? Um, is my mic on? Okay. I don't know if it is. You turned my mic on. Hello. Ah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so what, we, what happens is uh, you, your host name winds up being a combination of your stack name and your resource name. So what we actually did was, what you'll see in the uh, heat template when you go pull it down, is we used uh, the ran uh, random string function uh, t data type within heat to come up with a 10 character name. And then we basically took minion dash and hard coded, uh, the, well, hard -coded a random string that gets generated when the, when the uh, heat stack runs. Yeah. So um, by doing that, we were able to ensure that our host names uh, were less than 63 characters. 63 characters is also uh, needs to include the fully qualified domain name. So the whole thing needs to be under 63 characters. Otherwise, uh, it fails to join the cluster. And Heat's limit, by the way, is 128. So Heat just happily goes along creating these huge host names. And, you know. uh, some of the lessons we learned, right? Is it worth the effort? Yeah, I mean, as we've been kind of saying here, bare metal is slow. Kubernetes definitely has a lot of functionality that, that works well from an app-centric kind of point of view in this scenario. Uh, integration is key, and that's the kind of the thing you have to work at when you do this, when you take this approach. Uh, and as I mentioned, testing is really difficult. When, when things go haywire, you don't always know where it's happening, and you have to uh, really have your stuff together to figure that out, right? What we would do going forward, you know, uh, uh, you know, we think VMs are typically good enough. Uh, you can get a lot of density out of VMs. KVM's a level zero hypervisor. You can get a lot of performance and density out of it, right? Fast auto scaling probably has to be VMs. You're, you're not going to get that out of bare metal at this point in time. Uh, create extensible heat templates. You want to do that anyway. That's, that's. That should be your MO, no matter what. And especially true here, because you'll be tweaking them quite a bit. Uh, use OpenStack where it excels. And in this case, we used it, you know, we, at least we tried to use it uh, for where it excels in, with regard to integration and uh, uh, infrastructure, and especially ironic, right? And then finally, use OpenShift. Uh, you know, we, and, and that's not just a plug for OpenShift. You know, we did experience some of the barbs and, and razors of just pulling it down uh, from the upstream. And like we ran into a bug, for instance, we used kubeadm to deploy, which broke the UI. And we had all kinds of issues like that where um, we had to kind of go bug hunting to figure out why things weren't working. Wouldn't have probably happened with OpenShift.
Any questions, suggestions? Anybody have any ideas of how to do this better than we tried? <laughs> Nothing. Nobody. Everyone, anyone awake? <laughs> I, I know there's a, there's a happy hour going on right now. You're all probably thinking about that, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot more uh, Red Hat um, talks today and tomorrow. Just wanted to throw a few of these up here for you guys in case you wanted to check any of them out. These are all Red Hat talks. And if you guys didn't want to like go up to the microphone in front of everybody, feel free to come up afterwards um, and I'll uh, ask questions. Yeah.